Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are interested in this limit. We have a summation k from 0 to the floor of xn plus y square root n. x and y are positive real numbers, and n is a positive integer. The summand is xn all to the power k divided by k factorial. There is an outside factor e to the minus xn. We take the limit as n tends to infinity. Recall the Poisson random variable. A discrete random variable is Poisson with parameter lambda if it has the following probability mass function. The probability that x is equal to k is lambda to the power k e to the minus lambda divided by k factorial. If we look carefully here, considering this exponential with what we have inside the summation, we have xn to the power k e to the minus xn divided by k factorial. This looks exactly like the PMF of a Poisson random variable. The parameter is xn. This summation here, together with the exponential, is the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter xn is equal to 0 or 1 or 2 all the way to the floor of xn plus y square root n. In other words, the quantity that we have here is probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter xn is less than or equal to this upper summation limit, the floor of xn plus y square root n. One of the properties of Poisson random variables is that if a1 is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda 1, a2 is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda 2, and so on, and if those random variables are independent, then their sum is a Poisson random variable with parameter lambda 1 plus lambda 2 plus lambda 3, and so on. In other words, a Poisson random variable with parameter xn can be thought of as a summation of n Poisson random variables that are independent, and each one of them has a parameter x. A Poisson random variable with parameter x has a mean value of x and a variance of x. This quantity here is the probability that this sum of iid Poisson x random variables is less than or equal to the floor of xn plus y square root n. Subtract nx from both sides. So minus nx minus nx. The left-hand side can be written as summation j from 1 to n aj minus x. This step here is to have zero mean random values by subtracting x from each aj. Because aj for every j from 1 to n has a mean value of x, then aj minus x is a zero mean random value. Now we have a sum of those random variables. They are independent and they are zero mean. Divide both sides of this inequality by minus nx plus floor xn plus y square root n. Note that this is a positive quantity. No matter what x and y are, we are interested in the limit as n tends to infinity. For sufficiently large n, this is a strictly positive quantity. We will have it here on the left-hand side. We have a summation of iid zero mean random variables. The variance of each one of them is the variance of aj, which is x. And then we have this normalization factor, which is a function of a small n and also of these two positive real numbers, x and y. Our probability is that this left-hand side is less than or equal to 1. Now we will apply the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem tells us that as n tends to infinity, the left-hand side here converges in distribution to a zero mean Gaussian random variable that has a variance that is equal to this quantity here, x times limit as n tends to infinity of this upper limit of summation divided by the square of this quantity here. This is not the standard form of the central limit theorem. The standard form is that we have a summation of n iid zero mean random variables and those guys they have a finite variance and then we have an outside normalization factor which is one over square root n this converges in distribution to a zero mean gaussian with a variance equal to sigma squared where the variance of each one of those guys is sigma squared sigma squared in our case is x let's do a digression and verify this generalization of the central limit theorem. We have random variables, zero mean, iid, finite variance. We have here as an upper limit of summation, a positive sequence of integers, beta sub n. This sequence tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. In the standard central limit theorem, this will be n. Beta n is equal to n. In our case here, it is also equal to n. Now we take the summation and we divide it by gamma sub n. Gamma is a positive sequence of real numbers. Gamma n tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. The sequence beta n and the sequence gamma n, both of them tend to infinity as n tends to infinity. But they do so with the following restriction. The ratio beta n over gamma n squared, this ratio as n tends to infinity, converges to a positive real number. In the standard central limit theorem, beta n is equal to n, gamma n is equal to square root n. And so this ratio is n divided by the square root of n squared, that's n over n, that's 1. L is equal to 1. 
the claim now is that there is convergence in distribution to a zero mean Gaussian, but the variance of the zero mean Gaussian is not just sigma squared, but it is sigma squared times this L here. To prove this statement, let's start by the characteristic function of this summation. Because we are summing IID random variables, the characteristic function of the sum is equal to the characteristic function of one of the random variables raised to their number, and their number is beta n. The characteristic function of this random variable, x1 over gamma n, is the characteristic function of the random variable x1 evaluated at u over gamma n. The characteristic function of the sum of interest is the characteristic function of one of the x random variables. Let's say that they are all distributed as random variable x. And then inside here, the, the argument of the characteristic function is u over gamma n. And then the characteristic function is raised to the power the number of the random variables that we have in this sum, which is this beta n. If we take the natural logarithm of both sides, we have ln epsi is equal to beta n and then the natural logarithm of the characteristic function. Let's multiply and divide by gamma n squared. It is given in the statement of the theorem that limit as n tends to infinity of beta n over gamma n squared, that this limit exists and is equal to the positive real number L. Motivated by this, we take this beta n, divide by gamma n squared, and then multiply by gamma n squared. The limit of this guy, by assumption, is equal to L. Our job now is to investigate the limit as n tends to infinity of the other term. What is this limit? Gamma n tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. So we will study the limit of phi of alpha u divided by alpha squared as alpha goes to zero. Alpha is playing the role of one over gamma n. Rather than having this gamma n squared, we have in the denominator alpha squared. And then the argument of the characteristic function is alpha u. If alpha tends to zero, then the denominator goes to zero. The characteristic function tends to one as its argument tends to zero. And the logarithm of one is zero. This is a zero over zero situation. To evaluate the limit, we can make use of L'Hopital's rule. But L'Hopital's rule requires that we have differentiable function in the numerator and in the denominator. The denominator is okay. This alpha squared, it is differentiable and its first derivative is two alpha. In the numerator, if we differentiate, then we have one over the characteristic function. And then we have the derivative of the characteristic function. And because we are differentiating with respect to alpha, then a u will come outside this u here. But if I do this, I am assuming that the characteristic function is differentiable. Is this true? We have a rule. Our random variables, we have a finite variance, which means that they have a finite second moment. And the rule is the characteristic function of a random variable with a finite second moment is twice differentiable. Because we assumed that our random variables have a finite variance, indeed, our characteristic function is differentiable. In fact, it is twice differentiable. This step here is justified by this fact. Now, if alpha tends to zero, the characteristic function here tends to one, but we are still in a zero over zero situation. The reason for this is that we have alpha in the denominator, and then we have the first derivative of alpha in the numerator, and now we want to take its argument to zero. The first derivative of the characteristic function evaluated at zero is i times the first moment of the random variable. Because our random variables are zero mean, then we also have zero in the numerator as alpha tends to zero. To resolve this issue, we can apply L'Hopital's rule again, and we are justified in doing so because the characteristic function in our case by assumption is twice differentiable because we have assumed that our random variables have a finite second moment. If we differentiate the denominator, alpha becomes one. If we differentiate the numerator, we get the second derivative of the characteristic function. We will get an extra u. We are differentiating with respect to alpha. And so this u with this u, they give us u squared. We have one half. And then the second derivative of the characteristic function evaluated at zero is equal to minus the second moment, which is minus the variance if our random variables are zero mean. Our case here, so this is equal to minus sigma squared. The limit is minus one over two u squared sigma squared. This is the limit of this quantity as alpha tends to zero. And this is equal to the limit of this quantity as n tends to infinity. This term here tends to L. This term here tends to minus half u squared sigma squared. The logarithm of the characteristic function of the sum tends to minus one half u squared sigma squared L as n tends to infinity. The characteristic function itself converges to e to the minus one half u squared sigma squared L as n tends to infinity. By Levi's continuity theorem, if the sequence of characteristic functions converges pointwise to a function that is continuous at u equals zero, like in our case here, then indeed we have convergence in distribution to the distribution of the random variable that has this characteristic function. And this characteristic function is that of a zero mean Gaussian random variable with a variance that is equal to sigma squared L. This version of the central limit theorem tells us that if we have zero mean IID random variables with a finite variance sigma squared, if we have a summation of these from k equals one to beta n, where beta n is an integer, and the integer valued sequence beta n tends to infinity as n tends to infinity, if we take this sum and divide by gamma n, 
then there is convergence in distribution to a zero mean Gaussian. And what is the variance? The variance of this Gaussian is the variance of X1 or of any one of those guys. They are IID. So that's sigma squared times the limit as n tends to infinity of beta n, this guy here, the integer valued sequence, divided by the square of gamma n. Gamma n is a positive sequence that also tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. Now we can use our result in obtaining the limit of interest. So the quantity of interest is this probability here. And we will make use of the central limit theorem and say that this probability here, as n tends to infinity, is the probability that a zero mean Gaussian random variable is less than or equal to one. And what is the variance of this zero mean Gaussian random variable? The variance is the variance of one of those guys. And that's X because AJ is a Poisson random variable with parameter X. So we take the variance of one of the guys, X in our case, and then we multiply by the limit of N, the other limit of summation, divided by the square of what we have here, which is the floor of XN plus Y times square root N. And outside the floor, we have minus Xn. Our focus now is to obtain this limit here. We can take the floor and lower bound and upper bound it. We know that the floor of alpha is living between alpha minus one and alpha. Subtract Xn from all sides. Take this inequality and square all sides. And then take the reciprocal. The upper bound is one over y square root n minus one all squared. And the lower bound will be one over y squared times n. Then multiply all sides by n. Now the middle term is exactly the quantity of interest in our limit. This one over y squared does not depend on n. The limit as n tends to infinity is one over y squared. This side, we have n over y squared root n minus one all squared. And as n tends to infinity, we end up also with one over y squared. Our quantity of interest is sandwiched between two quantities. Both of them tend to one over y squared as n tends to infinity. By the sandwich or squeeze theorem, this limit here is exactly equal to one over y squared. The limit of this summation multiplied by e to the minus xn is exactly the probability that a Gaussian random variable that is zero mean and that has a variance equal to x over y squared is less than or equal to one. We have a zero mean random variable and the variance is x over y squared. And we ask ourselves, what is the probability that this random variable is less than or equal to one? This is equal to one minus the probability that the random variable is strictly greater than one. And so this will be the Q function of one minus zero, which is one divided by the standard deviation, which is the square root of X over Y squared. Our limit is one minus the Q function with the argument Y divided by the square root of X. Recall that the Q function is the complementary CDF of a standard Gaussian random variable.